Hey guys, it's Danny. Today, as promised, I will be talking a little bit more about the self-watering pots. We're gonna repot some more kids, practically take you along a little bit on the journey in testing out and discovering how good these pots will serve me. As you can see, I already have a potted cat Leia here. She already started to produce new roots, so it was the perfect time but I do want to try them out with other things such as Phalaenopsis and as promised yet again, I will tell you a little bit about them and the cons and what I don't like about them. So don't forget to give this video a like if you will end up enjoying it and why not subscribe? I try to post very regularly nowadays, not so much. Before we start the video, let me give you a, a little update on the plant room situation. So as you know, I am kind of renovating that's a bit of a big word. I'm not painting the walls. Well, not all of them, some of them. <laughs> I'm taking out some shelves. I am moving around stuff. And I also took down the sheer curtains that I have for the past four years to wash. And when I took them out of the washer, behold, they were shreds. And I thought, oh no, my washing machine shredded my curtain. It just so happens that it's a brand new washing machine because my old one broke and it's the first time I use it on those drapes. So I thought it was a problem with the washing machine, but no, the drapes were so, so brittle because of the sun exposure over the past four years that they're just disintegrating in my hands. So I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna go to Ikea and get some curtains, but I didn't actually have time to go to Ikea first thing in the morning. So half a day, my plant room was exposed to direct sunshine through the window. Mind you, it is the middle of October. And guess what? The sun heated up the shelf that I put in front of my southern window and it warped the first piece of wood. So I had to put some weights to try and straighten it out. Currently it is straight, not perfect, perfect, but pretty straight. So I put some orchids on it, put some weight on it in the hopes that it will eventually straighten up. Needless to say, I did get my Ikea curtains. I need to shorten them now. So yeah, emergency Ikea curtains were on the menu and also some other life stuff. So I think this thing will drag on forever. I don't know if I'm gonna finish this year, but anyway. Let's get back to the video because, hey, today I am posting, woohoo. So let me get you in closer and take a look at these pots. So I got these pots from Amazon. You will find them linked in my Amazon shop down below in the description. And the main reason why I got them is because they have this mechanism of showing you how much water you have in the reservoir. We might have some Maya action pretty soon because she likes these pots. She likes colors actually. Oh, hi, babe. <laughs> she landed on my vacuum. Aren't you distracting? All right, let's put you here. So I actually really liked this mechanism of showing you how much water you have in the reservoir. And also I really, really like the fact that they are wicking. They don't have those cones that go inside the reservoir. So practically you will not have your medium staying in the water. And I discovered that with sphagnum moss, that's actually an important thing. You're gonna fall, honey. With soils, it appears to work pretty well, but when it comes to sphagnum moss, it really isn't ideal to keep it soggy all the time. But this doesn't mean the pots are perfect. First of all, I don't know about this plastic. I don't know how durable it is. We shall see. Definitely, it's not the same quality as Lechuza's, but, oh! The price actually reflects the quality as well. So I'm gonna test them out. If I see the plastic becomes brittle, I'm not gonna keep them outside. I'm just going to use them with the orchids that I have in my grow space. And also they come with this wick. Now on their Amazon listing, they say this is cotton. And if it is, then it's not suitable as a wick. Since it is a natural fiber, it will rot pretty, pretty fast in contact with water. But to be honest, I don't think it's cotton. It doesn't really feel that way. Furthermore, I did my typical wick test. I left one part of the wick in a jar of water and the other part on a tissue paper. And guess what? After two days, because yes, I forgot about it with the whole greenhouse renovation, the water barely, barely wetted a little bit of the wick. It didn't travel at all. I also tried to submerge and really try to wet this wick and that didn't work either. It was very, very patchy. And when I tried to remove the water from the wick, nothing actually came out. So yeah, it's not a very wicking, very water absorbing material. I'm not going to use it. What I will use is my propylene string, which 
became a mess, but yeah, I've been using it a lot. This is the material Lechuza uses as well and most other self-watering pots use. You can find it at supermarkets. I actually found it at the supermarket. It is a synthetic fiber. It will not rot. It's easily washable and very, very durable. I did not throw one single string in all of these years that I'm using this material. You can just wash it with detergent, reuse it with other orchids. And from a spool like this, you can actually manufacture a lot of self-watering pots. So yeah, I will use this string for these pots rather than whatever this is. And the last con for me at least is that we don't have a lot of sizes to choose from. This one, yeah, it looks like a standard pot, but the pot inside only measures almost 10 centimeters in diameter while the big one is around 13 centimeters. So here you have something suited for mini Phalaenopsis and here something for standard Phalaenopsis, just to give you a practical idea. So if you have an orchid bigger than that, then sorry, no can do. There are no other available sizes, but you know what? We can work with these because these are actually the sizes that most orchids are kept at, whether through division, whether they grow more than this very, very slow. So it does fulfill most sizes, but not all of them. Anyway, with that blabbing and distraction out of the way, let's, yeah, honey, let's go ahead and pot some orchids. All right, so the first thing I will do is prepare my own wick. I cut a length of that polypropylene fiber, and as you can see, the ends are fraying a lot. I will use a torch to seal them since this is a plastic material. And also I want to use the wick doubled like this. So I'm going to keep them close to each other just so I make them stick. So here we go. There we go. They are now sealed and also they're stuck to each other. It keeps things a little tidy. So I'm going to feed this thread through the drainage holes and voila we have a brand new wick. And look at that sunshine. It was cloudy up until now. So let's make a little test. Yep, the wick reaches the bottom, we're set. As for the medium, I will use my typical bark and sphagnum moss. I will put sphagnum moss at the bottom to act as a further wick. And then throughout the layers of sphagnum moss, I will add bark. And the top layer will of course be bark. Now let's get the orchids, which I have already prepared. So let's start with the mini Phalaenopsis. This is one I just purchased because I could not help myself. I saw it at Ikea and somehow it got into my shopping cart. So I just left it there and I purchased it. I have an issue with mini fowls as much as I am not such a huge fan of the typical flower shop fowls. The miniatures, oh my, I kind of love. And this is one that's poloric. Isn't she cute? So yeah, I'd rather have a million mini fells than <laughs> standard fells. So I'll start with a layer of sphagnum moss at the bottom. Let's do a test. Oh yeah, the level looks okay. Now I'm going to continue with bark and I just realized this would be better to sit here. The filming position is a little bit weird because my table is really short and I have a short little chair and the tripod is practically in my arms. I'm embracing it practically. So it is what it is. One day my plant room will be finished. I'm also going to add some slow release fertilizer, especially with Phalaenopsis. It makes a difference. So I placed here six, seven beads. It really isn't a lot for a Phalaenopsis, which can eat up pretty much everything you can give it. There used to be another flower spike here, but it was broken. Oh no, maybe it's gonna branch out. Now, if you're new to orchids or to my channel, or you're just watching this video wondering how am I going to get my orchid to rebloom, I'll link you down below to the video that I made on reblooming Phalaenopsis orchids. There is a trick to them, unlike most other orchids. You can play with the temperature and make them bloom pretty much whenever you want. Not that I advise you to, but this kind of explains why we have Phalaenopsis pretty much all year long in flower shops and garden centers. You just have to trick them into thinking it's their blooming season. But of course, this trick also means that they do require a certain environment to start initiating their flower spikes. So if you don't provide the environmental conditions, your orchid might not actually bloom. Not because it's not healthy, not because you're not caring for it properly, but because of the environment, which doesn't go through a temperature change, which if you have a very healthy orchid is most likely the cause of your orchid not blooming. And here we go. My orchid is all potted up. All I will do now is water it, put some 
some water in the reservoir and I'll come back to show you how much water I put in here at the end. Let's just get another orchid. Next orchid, which I believe will enjoy this type of pot, is a slipper orchid. This is a Paphiopetalum. These guys are terrestrials and they absolutely dislike drought. They don't even put out aerial roots. There's no need. They're not epiphytic. And if you have that type of environment, which is prone to drying out very fast, a self-watering pot can actually be very beneficial with these types of orchids. So, as you know, my climate is exactly that. Things dry out super fast here. So, same story with this guy as well. I'm gonna use the exact same type of medium. Even if this is a terrestrial orchid, I just put a little bit more sphagnum moss to retain that water, a little less bark because the roots really don't like big air pockets and there we go using the same materials i'm creating a different type of medium to suit this orchid's needs i read a comment recently suggesting that i make a video with what type of media should we use for what type of orchid and i really cannot do such a video because i use the same type of medium for all of my orchids all i change are the ratios or the setup some orchids i purposely let dry a little bit more than others some orchids are not potted in the same pots that I typically use and so on and so forth. But when it comes to medium, first of all, I'm kind of limited here where I live when it comes to choice. So I'm trying to do everything with practically one type of medium, just mixed a little bit differently. And luckily for me, it does work, at least for the majority of my orchids. There are some that don't really want to respond, such as the Phragmipediums, but most of my orchids are okay with this mixture. And there we are, my Paphiopetalum is done as well. To give you an answer to that question, I honestly believe that most orchids can do great with the very same type of medium. If you change a little bit your proportions or the setup, which implies the pot as well, or the way you treat it, the way you water it, and the way you maintain it. There are exceptions and particularly with some terrestrial orchids, I find for me in my environment that this mixture is a little bit too airy, so I resort to all-purpose oils for them, but you might find in your environment that this mixture will work. So it's all about trial and error, and if you don't trust yourself to adjust, accordingly to the type of orchid you have, if you don't have enough experience just yet, then you can always go for a pre-mixed medium, such as the Repotme ones, which I do trust they're mixed well. Uh, but honestly, if you know what you're doing, you can use the very same type of materials for pretty much everything, with a few exceptions, but most everything should be okay. And the last orchid we're potting up is my Dendrobium harvianum, which, excuse that noise. <laughs> Either I record at night when I'm absolutely broken, I'm so tired, either I don't record at all. And I'm not gonna care about the noise because I cannot do anything about it. People will always find something to do around here. And that's how things go. This, however, does not stop me from dreaming that one day I will have a house in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's my ultimate dream. All right, so this is the Dendrobium harvianum, which you might remember I bought it. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm, I have to take a break. All right, take three. So this is the Dendrobium harvianum, which I potted in a clay pot because I thought it would do it good since it's supposed to be a cooler growing orchid. Mm, I don't think so. I didn't see major things happening to this orchid other than me having to water it very frequently due to dehydration since unglazed clay pots really do transpire a lot. So mm, I'm gonna go to the other extreme and use a self-watering pot so I don't have to water every three days. Now, there are a few things to touch base with here because I can already detect the comments. I don't really care about pot size because I finally, after quite a few years, managed to keep things under control and to mix my medium accordingly so that I don't actually have to worry about pot size. Furthermore, I can make pot size work in my favor. Why do I have to be limited to small pots because an article says so when I can use whatever pot I want and just be careful that I treat it accordingly? And well, I can say that I've reached a level of not caring that is beyond 9,000 <laughs> when it comes to pot size. So nowadays, I just use whatever pot I think 
will suit me and will serve me. Because here's the thing that I think we should understand if we're struggling with our orchids. It's not us serving the orchids or the hobby in general, it's the hobby serving us. And when we start to do things robotically just because somebody said so, then it kind of takes that rewarding feeling from it and it becomes a chore. And the last thing that I want is for this hobby to become a chore. I enjoy it so much that if I lose this, then I'm gonna be really, really sad. And in order not to become fed up with it, I need to make it serve me. I don't wanna serve it anymore. And pot size is one of them. And hold on, I need some steaks. All right, so I used some steaks. They are the hook type of steaks, which I find very, very suiting, not only for flower spikes, but also for cane structured orchids. Got myself some more sphagnum moss, let us continue. So where was I with the blabbing? Oh yes, pot size. Yeah, having a set of rules made by somebody who claims to know more than you can be reassuring, can give you a basis to start with, and that's good. I talked about this issue in a different video, I'm not gonna elaborate. Yes, pot size for beginners matters because one of the struggles for beginners is adjusting their watering regime. The bigger the pot, the more water it will retain, the more likely it is for a beginner to have some issues with suffocation of roots. But then after a while, you stop being a beginner and you start to have your own opinions and ideas about your orchid. And also you start to know your environment a lot better. And you discover that the same rules don't really apply. Or even if they do, they just make your life a little harder. And that's absolutely normal. And that's what happened to me too. All of these rules that we as beginners are used to simply don't apply. And it takes a little bit of courage to disobey them, especially when you don't have a lot of orchids or you don't have the budget to spend on orchids. And the worst thing you can do is just throw all of these rules out the window. That's never a thing you should do. What I believe you should do is start with small steps. If you feel like some rules are simply not serving you right, start to customize them just a little bit. Don't completely throw them out the window, but customize them. Don't take rash decisions and don't go to extremes, obviously. Take it slow and you might discover that the tiny little changes you will make in your routine end up not having any type of effect on your orchid, but they might actually have an effect on you and your ease of caring for your orchid. So if you find yourself being a little happier and the orchid not experiencing any change, then hey, you're on the good track. Learning stuff takes time. It is a process. You don't just become knowledgeable overnight. And the more bad stuff happened to you, the more you learn. So don't be afraid of bad stuff. Yeah, they're unpleasant. It's not nice to fail, but hey, this is how you learn. And in time, you'll discover that, hey, it wasn't so bad that you killed that orchid because now you know something that the other person you're talking to doesn't know. So you can give them advice. Furthermore, you can make your own little setups and your own judgment of how things should work, which serve you much better than whatever articles you followed at the beginning. So try to see the silver lining because I promise you it's there. And for those of you who tell me you have some bad experiences on forums or groups or whatever, really no one cares what everybody says, honestly. Just do what you feel like doing and really stop caring about what everybody says and what they think they know and so on and so forth. Alrighty, enough blabbing. I think we're done with the orchids. So let me bring all three orchids and wrap up this video. Alrighty, and here we are, everybody spotted. Now, for now, I'm not filling the entire reservoir because I don't know how fast it will initially evaporate. I do have this aeration hole here, which is actually pretty useful, but being that it's not summer anymore, I don't think it's necessary to fill the entire reservoir. And I think that's a good approach if you're not sure how fast your reservoir will deplete, how long your orchid will be wet for, if you know your environment is prone to some fungal issues, maybe powdery mildew and so on, and you know a wet medium will not help you out, definitely don't fill up the reservoir until you need to. And as a side note, actually, just because you have a reservoir in a self-watering pot doesn't mean you have to use it as is. You can consider this a normal orchid pot and this the decorative container. So whatever water collects here, you can dump it out 
and maintain your orchid without water in the reservoir if you don't need to, if you only need the reservoir in some seasons and in others you don't. That was one of the main issues people were talking about in the comments section a few years ago when I first started using self-watering pots. What do we do with orchids that need a winter rest or generally with orchids that have an active period and a dormant period? And well, just don't use the self-watering feature when you don't need it. You can definitely just water the internal pot through soaking or running water through it and dump out the water in the reservoir. I believe the setup is very versatile, so it's up to you and what you need in your imagination, how you're going to use it in the end. And with that said, I think it is time to end because yeah, people are getting unbearable here and it's starting to get on my nerves a little bit. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Again, you have links to these pods down below in the description. And with that said, I hope you have a great day. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, updates, and other fun orchid subjects. If you wish to support the channel, do consider becoming a member or visit the merch store linked down below in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. It's always nice to stay in touch there as well. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.